have been a lot of questions. <clears throat> I don't know. 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 I don't I don't I yeah, well, you did the flights in the car. Hey, get some. You're very serious. Yeah. I know. Uh, I think you lunch trial dough for some of the VA, you know. Um, I want to welcome everyone to Grand Rounds. It's so nice to actually be able to meet in person. We don't know how long that will continue. Um, I want to introduce literally an old friend, uh, Dr. Michael Gelfand. Uh, Michael, as you will learn, is a doctor's doctor. He gets more calls than anyone I know um, about obscure or complex diseases. Um, he's been a, a source of wisdom and insight to the infectious disease community nationally. Uh, no matter where you go in the United States, you will hear Dr. Gelfand's name brought up. Uh, I'm proud to know him. He's a true intellectual, a gifted chess player, and an extensive reader, actually a role model for many of us. Uh, as he talks today, uh, syphilis may be remote in our minds, but it's not remote to Florida. Of all the states, Florida leads the nation in congenital syphilis, which should not be the case. Florida has an increasing number of cases of syphilis. It's a, a very interesting disease. It's a great imitator. And I can't think of anyone better suited to discuss it than Dr. Gelfan, who is Hello, you have reached use of my and practical knowledge. Phone number and message, and I will get back to you as soon as. Thank you, uh, <clears throat> John. Thank you so much for a wonderful introduction and a comprehensive summary of my presentation, which uh, <clears throat> will. Is my task of presenting numerous slides now that you've covered them in some detail. Uh, it is exciting to be here in person. This is my first uh, presentation in person since the advent of COVID. And it's great to visit the free state of Florida, uh, where I'm allowed not to wear a mask during the presentation. Uh, a small correction uh, with regard to the topic, uh, and that is that I'm the most qualified individual in the room. In fact, Dr. Tony, who is facing me, is uh, uh, an expert of national repute on sexually transmitted disease and syphilis, and I try to entice him to give the presentation so that I can partake of delicious sandwich, but he uh, <laughs> maliciously refused to do so. Uh, uh, I was born in the former Soviet Union in Moscow, came to the United States in 1974. So if the lecture is interrupted by a sudden attack by the evil forces of Putin-esque uh, secret agents, I apologize. Uh, but we'll make the best of it. So uh, thank you, sir. <laughs> So let's go ahead and uh, hear a little bit about syphilis. Uh, I am a practicing infectious disease doctor. My principal responsibility is clinical, so 
my view of the disease is that of a clinician and uh, not a basic scientist or an epidemiologist, but we'll talk, talk a little bit about various aspects of this disease. So uh, just to summarize recent developments, uh, there has been increase not just in Florida, but elsewhere in the United States, in Europe, in Russia, in China. Uh, we've heard just very recently, a couple of days ago, that COVID period resulted in diminished screening and increase in syphilis in the United States, as well as other STDs. Uh, we are familiar with the association between syphilis and HIV, both in terms of target populations and the enhancement of transmission. Uh, the drug use has been of great importance in the United States in recent years in terms of increasing mortality due to overdose, but also with regard to transmission uh, of syphilis in uh, all population groups, the heterosexual males, females, and congenital syphilis have all increased. We'll discuss serological tests because ultimately if you are an internist, and this is internal medicine grand rounds, uh, your interaction with syphilis often commences with a test that is serological, requiring interpretation and management. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, uh, new diagnostic and treatment guidelines. So if you were to uh, uh, fall into stupor after a delicious meal that you are ingesting and miss the rest of my presentation, you will lose nothing because you can turn yourself to a wonderful source. And this is the STD uh, guidelines published recently in 2021 by the CDC. And the chapter on syphilis is extremely well written, very comprehensive, and will contain much of the information I'm presenting today uh, during this grand rounds. So uh, given the advanced age of the person who introduced me and my own, uh, we are uh, prone to invoke history. Uh, this is, of course, uh, Columbus who is reputed to be the introducer of syphilis into Europe from uh, Central and South America. And uh, while for a period of time it was thought to be somewhat problematic, it is in fact probably true uh, because uh, the endemic yaws existed uh, in Central America at the time of his uh, 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 entry into the field. And it appears that the strains were then transported on returning uh, uh, vessels to Europe uh, and this uh, sophisticated phylogenetic analysis that you are welcome to uh, uh, read about, but uh, it made me into a believer that this was a reverse biological warfare in exchange for smallpox and uh, other disease brought uh, from Europe. So there is some uh, pictorial uh, documentation of the event uh, when uh, syphilis was first introduced uh, into Europe. It was a very virulent disease resulting in outbreaks of high mortality. Uh, this is Albert Durer, uh, picture of a person with palmar rash that you will encounter in your exams as you go through training and subjected to multiple choices. Uh, you will recognize, if not from this picture, then from better uh, uh, depictions of palmar rash, but you can also see a large uh, pustular and vesicular lesions on the lower extremities. So this was a uh, virulent disease accompanied by fever and high mortality, not really what we see now in clinical medicine with syphilis, because presumably population uh, has been selected for uh, resistance. So just uh, a little bit of gratitude to our uh, historical antecedents. Uh, the the spire kit was described and discovered by uh, uh, a pair of German scientists. Uh, you can see the pictures here, uh, impressive uh, uh, mustache, uh, presumably unrelated to COVID at that time. Uh, and the name of the treponym, the, uh, uh, the turning thread that is uh, pale or pallid related to its uh, poor staining with uh, gram stain material. Uh, it is technically a gram-negative anaerobic or microaerophilic bacterium. It is spiral-shaped, it does have flagella, and it is very motile, which facilitates its penetration of the skin and entry into our system. So at the time when syphilis was recognized as a bacterial disease, uh, uh, people were struggling with the diagnosis. How do we diagnose it? It doesn't grow uh, in, in vitro. So how do we make a diagnosis? And so uh, Auguste Paul von Wasserman described the serological technique, uh, 
And fortuitously, he discovered that the serum of patients with syphilis cross-reacts with the extract of a bovine heart. As you can imagine, it's a lot easier to get a hold of bovine hearts than of the treponema pallidum that doesn't grow well. And this cross-reactivity has been uh, used since then uh, by all of us in using non-treponema testing, the VDRL and RPR, uh, the acronyms we tend to employ, but we are really uh, using the technique dating back to uh, the end uh, of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century. So obviously, as soon as the bacterial etiology became apparent, the treatment became a concern. And the first effective compound, the, the Salvarsan 606, was described by the Nobel laureate uh, Paul Ehrlich, who received this not for the syphilis treatment, but for work in immunology. And uh, he collaborated with his uh, Japanese student, Sakahiro Hata, and uh, this was first reported in 1909. Uh, and then, of course, we are all concerned about the ability of treponema pallidum to cause neurosyphilis, and the first description of CNS, uh, treponema pallidum, was by Hideo Naguchi, the famous uh, bacteriologist from Japan. So, uh, we still do not grow well treponema pallidum in vitro, and people inoculate the testes of rabbits, and I wanted to honor generations of rabbits who uh, had to be employed in this role. And in the politically correct style of today, I'm concealing the uh, <coughs> person here with the bar. So ultimately, the treatment emerged through the efforts of the uh, great uh, Scottish uh, uh, bacteriologist and scientist Alexander Fleming. You can see the recipients of the uh, Nobel Prize, the three scientists who collaborated in extracting penicillin and uh, making it available for clinical management during the Second World War. And if you don't want to read scientific literature, I strongly recommend this wonderful narrative history of penicillin discovery, uh, the mold in Dr. Flory's coat. And the reason it was in his coat is that it was being transported from England to the United States because the manufacturing capacity of the American industry was vastly superior to the British during the war, and this mold had to be taken to the American pharmaceutical companies to make large quantities of penicillin for the war effort and for the treatment of STDs, which was actually more incapacitating uh, for the troops, uh, for example, in North Africa in 1942, than the war injuries. So he had the mold sewn in the lining of his coat so that if he is captured by the Germans during the travel, uh, he will not have to reveal the existence of this great military secret. So as with many other uh, bacteriology misadventures, there was a notion for a while that with antibiotic advent will be able to control STDs well. This is a paper from The Lancet in 1958 uh, referring to these dying diseases and showing decline in syphilis. And sadly, this did not come true because of the human frailties and social uh, issues and uh, failure to control it effectively. So uh, here are a number of uh, uh, epidemiology slides that I wanted to share with you, showing that while, of course, as compared to 1941, there is dramatically fewer cases, if you look closely for more recent years, there's been increase in early primary and non-secondary syphilis. And the total number of cases between 2010 and 2019 have gone up, and we now know from the data two days ago that it continued to rise during the period of COVID. Uh, the distribution of syphilis by territory that Dr. Sinnott alluded to, you can see the dark blue of Florida. Uh, Tennessee is not quite as proficient as yet, but they're not far behind. Uh, and you can see that uh, the distribution uh, of syphilis uh, among men and women and men have outnumbered uh, women in recent years, and I will discuss the reason for that. Uh, and that, of course, is uh, the large number of cases of syphilis occur in gay men. So if you look at this diagram, 41.6% uh, in exclusive uh, uh, gay relationships, and then men with unknown sex or sex partners, another 17%. 
However, there has been a recent shift to some extent with the increasing number in women. So you can see that the ratio has decreased a little bit. And then uh, in terms of distribution by sex partners, men sex with men, or men sex with women and women. Uh, and this is the slide that I showed to my medical students and asked them to explain this discrepancy. And because I don't discuss previous slides with them just showing this slide, it's interesting that the number one answer for this discrepancy given is that uh, it is easier to see syphilitic lesions on the genitalia of men than women. That's the number one. And the second reason given is that for some reason syphilis infects men more than it infects women. And of course, the real reason for this discrepancy is the preponderance of uh, men uh, who practice uh, uh, gay sex. In terms of racial distribution, you can see that uh, a larger number of uh, disproportionate uh, African-American patients. And that, I think, is a testimony to the fact that it is a social disease. And unless it is controlled through the efforts of public health authorities and screening by all of us, our private physicians and people in public health, it will continue to be uh, a problem that will afflict us. Uh, in terms of the HIV relationship, you can see that uh, co-infection is common. Uh, it is known that uh, uh, having syphilis facilitates the transmission of HIV because of the break in the barriers of the mucosa. But clearly, there are some other factors involved, such as serous loading or uh, the perception that uh, sex is safe if you are controlled on natural retroviral therapy. Uh, and then drug use has been uh, a devastating uh, factor in overall uh, morbidity and mortality in the United States, but also in terms of transmission of syphilis and increase in primary and secondary syphilis, especially in people who use injectable drugs. Now, when you think about syphilis, you think about health departments and STD clinics, but it turns out that a lot of diagnosis occurs outside that setting as shown on the slide. And so we need to continue to educate our general physician population, not just during that training period, but to remind them about the importance of screening and looking for this disease. Uh, here is the percentage reported by uh, sex partners. Uh, the important point of this slide is that private physicians are reporting a lot of syphilis. So again, unless we continue to remind them about the importance of this disease, and they are all busy with other considerations in general health management, they may not screen people appropriately. So Dr. Sinnott alluded to the, the terrible fact of rising congenital syphilis. That's a corollary of syphilis in women, of course, and that relates to a variety of factors, including the use of drugs and uh, delayed screening, uh, uh, poor health care during the pregnancy, and also poor management of behavioral health, such as psychiatric illnesses. So when you look at the distribution of congenital syphilis, it's no surprise that the same areas where syphilis is prevalent is accompanied by a rise in congenital syphilis as well. And these are the factors that uh, explain this problem. Uh, no adequate maternal treatment, despite the diagnosis, no timely prenatal care, late identification of seroconversion during pregnancy, and delay in testing. So turning away from epidemiology, let's become clinicians for a second and talk about syphilis as a clinical problem. The definition of primary syphilis, a painless ulcer, that's very important uh, because uh, the patient may delay uh, uh, visit to a physician because of the lack of pain, which is construed to be a more benign. Secondary syphilis, skin rash, mucocutaneous lesions, and lymph adenopathy that can mimic almost anything, including FUR and collagen vascular disease. Tertiary syphilis with involvement of the heart, uh, tabus dorsalis, and general paresis. Uh, hopefully, we'll see less of it, uh, but with increasing syphilis, we may continue to see it. And then tumor like lesions that can be present anywhere in the body, including the central nervous system, mim mimicking glioma or in the liver mimicking uh, a hepatic uh, malignancy. And then latent syphilis, uh, which often is hard to classify because the person may not be able to tell you when he or she acquired 
surplus in the first place. Therefore, trying to divide it by one or two years is difficult. <clears throat> so when you look at me and say, well, this is the guy who is not an STD clinic, he's in a tertiary care hospital, or what does he know about syphilis? It turns out that being a great imitator, as Dr. Sinek pointed out, it can present in a variety of interesting fashions. And here are some of the recent examples from my service. Uh, a membranous nephropathy classically associated with syphilis, where the antigen of treponema pallidum triggers an immune response, resulting in profuse uh, proteinuria. Uh, lymphadenopathy and fear of unknown origin, the acute cerebrovascular accident in a relatively young person. And alopecia. Uh, uh, somebody sent me uh, an article a few minutes ago from Memphis uh, alluding to uh, wigs wearing in Europe during the uh, 17th, 18th century as concealing the alopecia of syphilis, promoting that fashion. Uh, all of these patients were HIV negative and were not viewed to be at high risk. Here's a gentleman with, uh, as you can see, anasarca with uh, abdomen distended with ascites, and lesions of secondary uh, syphilis. Uh, and the reason was, of course, uh, uh, membranous nephropathy from it, resulting in a requirement for uh, dialysis. Here's the cervical lymphadenopathy, uh, unrelated to a chancre in a person with uh, uh, secondary syphilis and fever of unknown origin. And uh, this lady presented with chest pain due to conventional coronary artery disease and incidentally complained to her resident about hair loss, which led to the investigation and diagnosis of uh, alopecia due to very high RPR of uh, 1 to 256. So briefly, the natural history, uh, the incubation period is about three weeks. Uh, then you may have a chancre. And let's pretend that this person is not being treated by anybody and is being observed uh, as part of the natural history of syphilis. Uh, so it may persist for one to three months, uh, resulting in secondary syphilis with dissemination. Uh, that will also occupy one to three months and may have recurrences of the rash. You may have the crops coming and going. Uh, eventually, uh, you become asymptomatic, developing latent syphilis, the early latent, one to two years, followed by late latent. And interestingly, neurosyphilis can occur during any of the stages. Uh, asymptomatic during primary, but abnormal LP if you were to do it. Uh, meningovascular syphilis or meningitis during earlier phases, and then tertiary syphilis. Now, let's say you are not treated. What happens to your serologists and to your clinical illness? Uh, it's easy to remember about a third will continue for life to have anti-treponemal antibodies, uh, meaning FDA or TTPA, the things that you get as confirmatory tests. But this will stay positive for life, whether you are treated or not. About a third of the people will lose their RPR. About a third will continue to have RPR and FDA with no disease. And about a third will continue to be seropositive, but will develop tertiary syphilis manifested as cardiovascular uh, aneurysm or coronary osteal disease, or gamma or neurologic disease. So this just recapitulates the notion that neurosyphilis, as you see on the slide, meningeal, meningovascular, or general paresis of tabus darzelis, occurred during various stages of syphilis. But all of the times, <clears throat> you have dissemination of the treponema into central nervous system. Therefore, the patient is at risk for neurosyphilis at all times of the disease. So how do you diagnose it today? Uh, we don't extract cardiolipin from a bovine heart anymore, but we still are using a variety of tests because there's no single definitive test, unfortunately. And so we still use non-treponemal serology at the bottom of the slide, and we still confirm it with treponemal serology, although as you'll see in a minute, we sometimes flip the sequence starting with treponemal first. Multiple tests are available, and the choice, of course, relates to where you practice and what your hospital or clinic will send the test for. But there's a general broad categories of non-treponemal tests where the antibody is against the surrogate antigen, not treponema pallidum. And it's a matter of convenience. 
And then the treponemal test, which tests for real antibodies against real treponemes. So when you see a patient, uh, you are expecting induration, a painless ulcerative lesion, and a clean base. One, here's a classic uh, uh, syphilitic chancre on the penile uh, skin. And here is a typical uh, palpable lymph node in the groin that is painless, firm, non fluction There's no redness over it, and the patient may or may not report it unless you palpate it. Here is the vulvar lesion uh, in a female patient, which of course can be confused with herpes and other ulcerative lesions. And here's a quote from a, a great English poet, John Keats, who also happened to be a medical student at the time of composition. And you can see that he is very descriptive of the introital lesion, which is not found unless examined. So a pelvic exam in a patient with suspected syphilis uh, is crucial. So here is a classic single chancre, but they can be multiple. And of course, if you show this on the test, you will answer herpes simplex. But it turns out that patients with HIV not infrequently will have multiple chancres. And chancres can be present in extra genital locations, such as on the nipple or in the mouth. So most of us do not have uh, access to dark field microscopes. And therefore, we don't get the pleasure of observing the motile spirochetes. We just see a picture. But here, if I can activate this movie, I wanted you to see what they look like when they are trying to invade your skin after being uh, placed in the act of intimacy. So you believe me now when I say they are truly motile and they're very active and they do get around. So here you are in the clinic or uh, on the wards and the person shows you a lesion. And the question then is, what do you do when the RPR in this person is negative? Uh, have you ruled out uh, syphilis or not? Do we have anybody willing to sacrifice him or herself and answer it? <laughs> Absolutely. And it is false. And the reason is that the sensitivity of the RPR VDRL, our usual screen, is about 70%. And even most sensitive treponemal test, if you happen to employ that, is only about 85%. So if you had access to a PCR, that would be the preferred test, as just published in the British Journal of uh, Sexually Transmitted Infections. But it is not yet commercially available widely. So we have to then do a variety of things. We can retest the patient, we can treat the patient empirically depending on their logistics. <coughs> Secondary syphilis is a, indeed a great <laughs> imitator. This summarizes uh, all the multiple ways in which it can present from hepatitis to nephrotic syndrome, glomerulonephritis, alopecia, arthritis. And I'm not gonna belabor it. You all have cell phones if you are willing to take a picture, but this is what you will be shown on the test and in real life, copper pennies. Great description, although nobody uses pennies anymore, uh, of the uh, papillous squamous lesions on the uh, palms. And you can also have uh, pediasis like lesions. And of course, you always carefully examine oral mucosa because the lesions can mimic leukoplakia, they can uh, mimic malignancy. So anything in the mouth of a patient suspected of syphilis should trigger a concern. And you should examine the variety of other areas. This is condyloma lata, L-A-T-A. Condyloma acuminata is the HPV that hopefully will eliminate with the vaccine. But lata is uh, syphilis and it is very infectious. This is a biopsy from our satellite hospital where it was thought to be a malignant. And you can see silver stain of innumerable trepanema pallidum spirochetes uh, infiltrating the tissue. So here's another patient, a 43-year-old gentleman who presents with a palmar rash, just like you saw. He is sexually active with a new female partner employed in the chemistry lab where he comes in contact with a variety of irritants, and he has a history of psoriasis. His partner has a remote history of possible syphilis. Examination shows papillar rash in both palms, and his RPR is negative. Uh, the chance that this patient has a secondary syphilis is 0.0001%. 
Dr. Sunna? It is less than 1%. And the reason is the sensitivity of RTR and MHCTP is very high in secondary syphilis, presumably because you have very large number of antigenically carrying spirochetes. Now, there are some laboratory phenomena, such as prozone phenomenon, that people in the lab are familiar with. If you have a typical syphilis patient and negative RTR, you will dilute the serum to eliminate that from consideration. But in the real world, uh, it is a very good screening test for secondary syphilis. This person probably has uh, contact dermatitis. And then, as I mentioned, about a third of the people uh, with tertiary syphilis, late syphilis, lose their RTR, but everybody carries their MHATP for life. So if you are trying to find out if your prospective marital partner ever had syphilis, rather than is suffering from active syphilis, you will use an MHATP to screen him or her to find out uh, what their background is. A small percentage of people who are treated for syphilis will lose their MHATP early if they are treated very early in their illness. So what we normally do then is we uh, suspect syphilis, we do syphilis serology, and we do this uh, non-trapanemal region test, like RTR, VDRL. If it's negative, we're done. And if, uh, if positive, we do it tighter because it has predictive value in terms of probability of the disease, the activity of the disease, and it will be monitored for response. So that explains why people don't like to do screening serology with this region test because it's labor intensive for the lab. Uh, we then do reflex treponemal test. Most of the hospitals will send it off automatically. And if it's negative, you may have a false positive region test. And how common is that? If it's positive, of course, you have a disease. It turns out that non treponemal tests do have false positives, uh, usually in low prevalence populations. So if you have uh, elderly nuns, it is likely to be false positive. And they do require confirmation with treponemal tests. They're manual, they're labor intensive because you have to titer. And you can do quantitation, so it's a disadvantage in terms of labor, but it's advantage because you can follow up after therapy. The titer should decline, four fold at least. You can detect reinfection when the titer will go back up. And reinfection in syphilis populations is not unusual. And you can predict CNS involvement if the titer is high. And you can distinguish acute versus chronic infection. And they resolve with therapy. So a useful test to monitor. Innumerable reasons reported over the years for false positives, collagen vascular disease, pregnancy, variety of chronic infections. I'm not going to spend time on this slide, but keep that in mind. And you can occasionally have a false positive treponemal test, even though it's more specific, usually in people with immune responses like collagen vascular disease. And I promise not to talk about COVID today at all, just forget about it. But sure enough, a report of a false positive RTR in people immunized with the COVID vaccine. So. Dr. Sinnott has close ties with anti-vaxxers in this community, and I was hoping that he will not share this information with that population group, because that will be another reason why they will avoid being immunized. So we mentioned not treponemal tests reflecting disease activity. Uh, Four-fold decline is an indication of therapeutic success, so you may not completely eliminate the titer, but it should go down. It will increase with reinfection. Uh, you may have people who will become seronegative, but there will be a population of so-called serofast where you'll have a low titer, undiluted, one to two, persisting for a long time. And if they are tested repeatedly, it will initiate the sequence of efforts that they need to be interrupted by labeling the chart. And if you are thinking about success of neurosyphilis therapy in terms of repeating an LP or just celebrating, if you have a significant decline in the RTR, it has strong predictive correlation with success of treatment for neurosyphilis. Treponemal tests, as I mentioned, in a small percentage of patients will become negative if treated early, but most of the people will maintain for life. They're not quantitative. They're not used to assess treatment response or reinfection, but they are automated. 
and that is very attractive if you are testing large populations, the, the blood donors, or people you are screening in the military service. So you will notice in a minute that there are some places where they start with a treponemal test and confirm with a non-treponemal test. So you have a reverse algorithm. So who do we screen? We screen people at high risk, pregnant women and blood donors. And so let's say we start with an automated treponema paladin test. If it is negative, the syphilis is ruled out. Remember, people keep it for life. So if it's negative, they have not had syphilis before. If it's positive, then we have to confirm it because there is a percentage of false positives. And so we do an RPR, we reversed the algorithm. If it is positive, we confirmed. If it's negative, what does that mean? Uh, it may mean a variety of things. Uh, it may mean that there's an old infection that was treated, old infection that is untreated, but they lost their RPR, a false positive test, or very early primary infection before RPR becomes positive. So we'll take a history. We will uh, uh, find out if they were treated. We'll uh, possibly do the second test and see if it's positive. And if the second test is negative, do we stop or do we do a third test? And then I think at that point we refer the patient to a true expert like Dr. Tony. And of course, counseling. Uh, usually late syphilis is not infectious, but it's reasonable to screen the partner. So here we have the scenario of a negative reflex reagent test after positive automated test. Do a second treponemal test. And it's positive in 83% of the patients and negative in 17. And it really relates to the population you are testing. Because if you are testing population with high prevalence of the disease, then a false negative is a concern. If you are testing population with low prevalence of the disease, then you have less to worry about. So in terms of treatment, uh, it is certainly curable today. I was in uh, Phoenix visiting a nice desert uh, facility and I ran into a, a plant that's called Euphorbia antisyphilitica and I was all excited about introducing a new pharmaceutical. It turns out it's not terribly effective, but it is compounded into cream and used for genital lesions in some parts of the world. So the treatment is penicillin and I will run very briefly through this presentation. Uh, it is essentially prolonged therapy with injected penicillin that lasts a long time in your system and you need to follow up the patient, make sure they responded. Uh, you may have a reaction to penicillin, Jerry Schock's armor reaction where you have fever and chills and it is uh, more likely in patients with HIV, slightly so. If you have a high RPR titer and early syphilis, and usually it occurs about four hours after the injection. So if you send the patient home, you need to educate him or her about the possibility so they don't bounce back to the emergency room. Uh, penicillin allergy is the bane of syphilologists and people who treat syphilis because it makes it more difficult. You can use oral treatment, doxycycline, but of course adherence becomes a concern. You can give injectable septriaxone, but that's 10 days of therapy. And unfortunately, azithromycin is no longer an option because of the emerged resistance. Or you can try to desensitize the patient if it is available. Here is septriaxone in early syphilis, a paper from China showing that it is very effective, although labor intensive. And in secondary syphilis was even more effective than penicillin. Uh, in latent syphilis, uh, early treatment is a single dose, late treatment three doses, and the difficulty is finding out how long they've had it. Often, as I mentioned earlier, the patient may not know, and then you will err on the conservative side and give three injections. Uh, if you are allergic, you have the same dilemma. Uh, it is hard to take doxycycline for four weeks. If you have a reliable patient, that's an option. The safety exome certainly is an option, although not well studied. And then the crucial issue of syphilis and pregnancy, where obviously you want to screen early and often if you have a high risk patient. And the only treatment is penicillin. Uh, 
So if you have an allergic patient, the patient needs the services of uh, effective allergy consultant. And unfortunately, what happens in our area is as following. Uh, I'm an ID fellow, and I want you to desensitize my pregnant <laughs> syphilis patient to penicillin. I'm an allergy fellow, and I hate you. I will not miss my ball game. Because it takes several hours and a lot of effort, but it is the right thing to do. And certainly on the test, if you ask the question, it is penicillin. Neurosyphilis uh, very quickly are uh, present in all stages, although in early syphilis with a shanker, you don't do an LP unless you have symptoms because you will find abnormalities you don't want to know about. And they are eradicated with the usual treatment for primary syphilis. Uh, symptomatic disease, uh, early aseptic meningitis, mimicking enteroviruses and other things. Cranial neuritis, eyes and ears, uh, meaning vascular strokes change in mental status with delirium. And later, hopefully none of us will see much of it, uh, the spinal cord degeneration with funny walking, general paresis with dementia. And so on. Uh, ocular syphilis has been coming to our attention more and more. There have been many reports of outbreaks, at least in terms of detection and reporting of ocular syphilis. So this is equated with uh, uh, neurosyphilis. Uh, ocular syphilis, ophthalmic syphilis. And then other syphilis, uh, if you subscribe to the notion that Beethoven's uh, deafness was related to it, although there's a debate among musicologists whether it was other sclerosis. Uh, again, variety of manifestations. So the patient with these manifestations should be screened for uh, syphilis and patients with syphilis should be asked about it. The diagnosis. Uh, you don't start diagnosing unless you have positive blood serology and neurological signs and symptoms. You don't tap people unless they have something to go for. There is no single test. Uh, beware of a bloody tap. Uh, the pleocytosis greater than five cells, except in uh, HIV where you have a baseline slight pleocytosis. Elevated protein. The CSF VDRL is very specific, but not very sensitive. The CSF treponemal antibodies are very sensitive, but not very specific because you have a passive transfer of antibodies. So as you look at the slide, you are saying, well, I'll need an ID consult, especially on Saturday or Sunday. And that is indeed true because oftentimes it's a matter of clinical judgment rather than a single definitive test. Uh, the CSF abnormalities are common in the absence of neurological abnormalities in early syphilis and they don't influence therapy. So don't have people who are asymptomatic. Uh, obviously, uh, if you have clinical meningitis, neurologic abnormalities, or treatment failures by RTR and not coming down, LP will be reasonable. And keep in mind the eyes and the ears. Uh, the treatment is uh, prolonged intravenous penicillin, which is cumbersome and delays discharges unless you can arrange for home IV therapy. You can also give multiple injections of procaine with prebenicid, keeping penicillin from being evacuated from the brain by chloroid plexus. But that is uh, painful, and you only employ that if you are disliking your patient. Uh, Ceftriaxone in a penicillin allergic patient, can we do that? It turns out that probably we can. This is unfortunately a retrospective rather than prospective study from France, reported recently in Lancet ID, and you can see that they use 10 days plus, so once a day, two grams septiaxone, and actually had impressive results in the treatment of all categories of neurosyphilis, HIV patients, non-HIV patients, et cetera. So when we follow these people, it turns out that if your RPR normalizes in the blood, you may not need to do an LP. It's still a matter of some debate and contention, but at least under the circumstances of limited health care, that may be a reasonable option. There's no need to repeat CSF exam. We see our logic of clinical response, and that is true with HIV, people on antiretroviral therapy, and non-HIV patients. Uh, a few other pointers. Uh, we are uh, excited about free exposure prophylaxis to prevent HIV. As I mentioned, there is some liberalization of behavior related to it, which may be accompanied by increase in syphilis. So education of the patient and counseling is crucial. Uh, and then can we prevent 
uh, syphilis by giving doxycycline before or after a high risk sexual encounter. That's a matter of much interest. There's no definitive study that would have led to a recommendation, but it is something to keep an eye on because we may end up giving doxy prophylactically either before or after. Syphilis is an old disease. It's been uh, with us for a long, long time. And I was excited about being able to present this lecture and also wanted to thank Dr. Sinnott. You might think that I'm commenting on his chronological age. I'm actually <laughs> just uh, expressing my respect and admiration for his accomplishment. So uh, we are in Florida, uh, and both Dr. Sinnott and myself are elderly uh, males. And uh, people intend to sort of uh, stereotype people, but it turns out that the greatest generation is still actively transmitting sexually transmitted disease, including syphilis. So uh, when you see a patient, keep in mind the possibility. Uh, remember that life of the sexually transmitted disease and the mortality rate is 100%. <laughs> so syphilis is not unique. And thank you all very much for your attention. And uh, I promised to finish on time and I fulfilled my pledge. So I'll be delighted to answer questions you might have if I can. And if I cannot, Dr. Tony will answer them capably. Thank you all. Ultimately, if you have an elderly, 
a reckless force of murder. Yes. Obviously, you'll be screening and managing your baby in here because it's and I told us told you the baby will fall. Well, they should refer the child to you and I told you to make that decision for you. I'm always concerned with medical legal situation in your case, because of the fragrant manner in which you but as long as you have adequate malpractice coverage, I think that's good. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, you're always right in the charge, especially about this first of all. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, you know, you know. Well, the rise of the congenital syphilis presumably relates to the same concerns and considerations we discussed, and that is lack of screening, less of contact with healthcare because of reluctance to see the physician early enough in pregnancy, but also the increased use of drugs and the, the considerations of transmission. So, other than dealing with the uh, the same issues we deal with with all other aspects of civil nothing specific. I think it's really trying to educate them on early and free and frequent ideas. I don't know if that answers your question. This is uh, this is a concern that is occurring with every flare of syphilis unavoidably translates in congenital syphilis. Thank you. I appreciate the history. It was that was interesting. I, do you have any ideas of why syphilis hasn't become resistant to penicillin, or is it becoming slowly resistant to penicillin over? It time? does not appear to be resistant at all. There's no evidence that there's any, been any MIC drift or increase in resistance. And this is not necessarily unique because even if you look at the organism, you would predict would be more likely to develop like this trail. We still see very very little. Resistance, although there have been recent spike trains and rising MICs and so on. So hopefully we'll continue to see more resistance to penicillin because it, it would be a catastrophic development. Uh, part of it relates probably to our ability to use prolonged therapy and, and other areas. It's very, very susceptible to very concentrations and mystery. Because if you look at the CNS levels of bicillin, uh, they're that tiny, but truly they are subtherapeutic. Nevertheless, the uh, frequent CNS involvement in primary and secondary syphilis is eradicated by a single injection of bicillin because of the prolonged therapy and exquisite susceptibility of it. That even very low levels in the CNS are adequate enough. So uh, I think we all should pray for consistent susceptibility of syphilis. Yes. To kind of piggyback on that for Dr. Ledford, so. For leptospira, we know that they don't like to take in plasma. And so a lot of resistance cassettes, as we all know, are on plasma. So more than likely what it is is that 
pyrochetes in general don't like to take on plasmids, therefore they won't be able to take on those resistance cassettes. It can happen, and when you try to really force, when you do leptospire research like I've done in the past, when you try to, to really force those plasmids in, they don't like it. And usually they don't, they don't survive long. And so to transform them is really difficult in the lab. Um, I don't know if it can be translated to the other spirochetes per se, but that would be the hypothesis. I think that would be the next step of sponsoring research on the development of resistance in spirochetes. We have sponsored by the National Institute of Infectious Disease to see if we can engineer this organism and release it into the population. <laughs> I'm being facetious, but no, I, I, think I, I thank you for your comment because, as you recall, I introduced myself as a clinician and not what you represent my expertise, but this is a fantastic comment. Uh, do you know if anybody ever tried to induce resistance via the uh, other trans element by transposons or just uh, conjugation? Well, I know with leptospira it's been tried. And right, done. but not with treponema pelvis. Not to my knowledge, but I mean, again, it's you can extrapolate it and at least have the hypothesis that uh, you know, there's Thank a you. common ancestor and they probably yeah. don't like it. Also, the way their structure is, plasmids are kind of hard to put in there. The way that their chromosome is, it's very elongated and uh, they just don't like it. It's a very interesting thing. Is that true for Boreala too? Well, that's that would be the hypothesis. Again, most of the work that's been done has been in Leptospira just because of its nature and you can grow it easy. Um, there are other spirochetes that are more difficult to grow. This is that's that's just my my hypothesis only. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Um, a couple of years ago, Dr. Edmondson started <coughs> improving the propagation of the endless strain of by cultivation of I have not seen anything since then. Uh, hence, hence the generation for the instance of uh, alpines suffering the depredations of left trying to have injected past this time. So, so the antigens employed today are synthetic, they are not expected from the world. She was only propagating. Thank you all very much. It's a pleasure to see human faces. Thank you. I was going to give my. Uh, I think we can bring it back. Uh, I think we can bring it back.